Good morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Titus chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 to 5. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inspired word. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together as your people. We thank you for bringing us here safely. Uh, Father, we pray this morning that you would open up our eyes, uh, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we may be able to see what is really in your word. Uh, we pray that your spirit would do what only you can in giving us spiritual eyes. Uh, and we pray that you would give us a willingness to accept what is preached from your word. And may only truth be proclaimed. And uh, may you be honored through this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we pick up this week where we left off in to Paul's instructions to Titus in Titus chapter 1. Paul discussed the qualifications for elders in the church, and he warned Titus to rebuke and to refute the deceivers and the empty talkers. Those are the false teachers who would be leading people astray. So in contrast to them, Paul says here to Titus in chapter 2 verse 1, but as for you... Teach what accords with sound doctrine. So in contrast to those insubordinate, empty talkers who are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work, as we saw at the end of the last chapter, Titus, in contrast, is called to teach what accords with sound doctrine. So this is another reminder for us that elders in the church need to know theology. They need to know doctrine. They need to have a good understanding of the truths of Scripture. Uh, so what is doctrine? What is sound doctrine? As Brian mentioned last week, doctrine is teaching. Uh, so true doctrine is true teaching. Sound doctrine is healthy teaching. Um, and as Pastor Brian mentioned last Sunday, every time somebody makes a statement about God or Jesus or salvation, it is a doctrinal statement. It is a statement of theology. So it's really true that you cannot actually escape from doing theology. Everybody does theology, whether you think you are or not. The question is, will we be good or bad theologians? And so the core or central doctrine or teaching of Christianity is the message of the gospel. It is the good news that although men have sinned against our holy God and maker, he sent his son who lived a perfect life, died the death that we deserved on the cross as a payment for our sins, that he rose to life, defeating death, and that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. All of us fallen sinners who turn from our sin and put our faith in Jesus, throwing ourselves upon his mercy, will receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So then to teach what accords with sound doctrine is to give the true message of the gospel and to teach people the kind of living that is in accordance with that message. So this is vital because there is only one God and only one gospel, and so elders must be able to rightly handle the word of truth. And for this, they need to know the scriptures. They need to have a solid grasp of the truth so that they will be able to teach the church what accords with sound doctrine. As we are saying, this is vital because there is only one God and one gospel, and there is only one way to salvation. There is only one way to be made right with God. And so it is very, very, very important that we get this message right. The great mission of the church is to proclaim the gospel, making disciples of all nations. If we're going to be faithful in our mission, we then need to know what this gospel is. So there is a very special responsibility on the elders of the church to teach what accords with sound doctrine for the salvation of God's people and for faithfulness to Christ in the mission that we have been given as a church. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. 
Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Right teaching leads to right practice. There is a certain way of living that follows from the gospel, and Titus is called here to teach the various groups of people in the church to live in a way that is in accordance with sound doctrine. So, one of the implications of this is we will see that not all ways of living will be in accord with sound doctrine. There is a way to live that is in accord, and there is a way to live that is not in accord. Certain lifestyles are completely out of sync with the gospel, and are therefore completely out of bounds for the Christian. Scripture is abundantly clear that God cares a lot about how we live. As we will continually emphasize here, our righteous living is not the ground of our acceptance before God, but it necessarily flows from it. To be a Christian is to be born again. It is to receive a new heart and a new nature. The Holy Spirit removes our heart of stone and grants us a heart of flesh. Someone then claiming the name of Christ who, go, who goes on sinning, living a lifestyle of unrepentant sin, is giving evidence that their nature has not been changed. Jesus says in Matthew 7 verse 18 that a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. If our lives are not producing good fruit, we do have serious reason to question whether we are a good tree. God's grace never gives us license to sin. Jesus' sacrifice was not given that we may now sin with impunity, but rather it was given to cleanse us of our sin and to give us a new nature. So Paul here instructs Titus to teach the various groups of people to live in a way that accords with sound doctrine. Their lives ought to reflect the realities of being gospel citizens. He begins by addressing the older men, followed by older women. And before we get into these instructions, I want to pause and make an important observation from the fact that he specifically addresses the older men and women. So notice this. Seniors matter to the life of the church. The character of older men and women matters to God, and it matters a great deal for the health of the church as a whole. So think about it. If the elderly were simply supposed to fade into the background of the church as people who are simply along for the ride, then why would God bother giving specific instructions for how they ought to live? So the very fact that God gives instructions to the seniors tells us that their lives and their character matters a great deal to God and to the health of the church. Seniors have an important role to play in the life of the church. In Ephesians 4, the church is described as the body of Christ. And we know that a body can only function properly when each part is functioning properly. So this means that all the members need to be doing their part. So that means the children matter, the youth matter, the young adults matter, the regular adults matter, <laughs> and the seniors matter. Wherever you find yourself on life's journey, you matter to God, and your life and character is really, really important to the health of the church. You have an important part to play in the life of the body. There is no such thing as retirement from the body of Christ. So let's dive in what God wants the older men to be like. Verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. So to be sober-minded is to be watchful over oneself. The word here could be translated as vigilant. Only a sober man can be truly vigilant or watchful. This statement is likely one that correlates to the instruction to the older women not to be slaves to much wine. So an older man must be watchful over his conduct in such a way that drunkenness would not allow for. He must also be dignified. He must be worthy of honor, having a certain type of seriousness or gravity to his character. He is a man that has learned through experience and discipline to put away the foolishness to which youth are inclined. No offense to the youth intended. To be dignified is to be a man who lives respectably, 
to live in a way that allows him to hold his head high as an honorable man. A godly older man is a man who is self-controlled, a man who does not give in to his sinful passions, but is temperate, deliberately controlling himself, not giving in to the whims of his flesh. Self-control is something that must run deep. God calls us to be responsible for ourselves, and this extends to our thoughts, our desires, and our emotions. A man who abstains from fornication or adultery while letting his thoughts run wild or looking at pornography is not a man who is modeling self-control. Jesus says that if anyone even looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he has committed adultery with her. Our thought life does not get a free pass from the Lordship of Christ. If we are committing sins in our minds, whether it's lusting after a woman or harboring hatred in our hearts for our neighbor, we are called to put that sin to death. Jesus Christ is Lord, and if we claim that he is our Lord, then we need to acknowledge his Lordship over our thoughts. There is no area of life where we get an exemption. Older men must also be sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Their faith ought to be sound, that is, it ought to be healthy. As someone walks with the Lord, their faith ought to mature as they do. In Scripture, new Christians are sometimes referred to as being spiritual infants or being babes in Christ. When you first come to the Lord, you are described as a spiritual infant, somebody who still needs milk and is not ready for solid food. Now, there is the expectation that there will be growth and maturity in faith that comes from years of walking with the Lord as our faith deepens. So even as the health of our body may decrease, the health of a man's faith still ought to increase. I've been very blessed that I had two godly grandfathers who modeled this very well. As their bodies deter deteriorated, their faith did not. They both meant, went to meet the Lord with confidence. And so an older man who is sound in faith is a blessing and an encouragement to his friends, his family, and to the entire church. An older man is also called to be sound in love. He ought to be able to set an example of what it is to love well. As we know, love is the primary duty of the Christian. Our first and greatest command is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second command is like it. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. So for, and then us as men, as husbands, our primary assignment is to love our wives the way that Christ loved the church. So in every single situation, wherever you find yourself, the life of a Christian man ought to be marked by love. Now, this does not mean that we're called to run around hugging everybody, just telling them how much we love them. Uh, in fact, the love for your wife ought to look significantly different than the love for your neighbor. In Romans 13.10, we get this, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So it stands to reason then, if you want to know how to love well, study the law of God. The Ten Commandments are a summary of the law, which Jesus then further breaks down into the two, love God and love others. So if love is a summation of the law, then if you want detail on how to love well, study God's law. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Do not covet. In all situations, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We'll look more at what love looks like when we come to the instructions to the young woman. Finally, an older man ought to be sound in steadfastness or patience. Older saints ought to be the ones with the greatest patience among us, simply from having had the most experience and the most opportunities to practice their patience. In James 1 verse 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So, 
if trials are opportunities to produce patience or steadfastness, then the older saints among us ought to be the greatest examples of steadfastness because they have likely faced the most opportunities to develop through the trials of life. With each difficulty that we face, it is an opportunity for us to grow in our character, an opportunity to increase in our trust in God and to develop patience and steadfastness through it. Verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. These three verses do an awful lot. Seeing the instructions to both the older and the younger women in one place gives us a great picture of what biblical womanhood looks like across all stages of life. Verse 3. First, older women are to be reverent. They must be appropriate in speech, in dress, in their attitude, and in their conduct. They are not to be boisterous and noisy, but should rather be meek and gentle. A reverent woman is a respectful woman. As Peter writes in 1 Peter 3 verse 4, they are to adorn themselves with the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. They must not be slanderers or slaves to much wine. A godly woman must not be a gossip or a slanderer. The word slanderer can be translated as false accuser. God's law has very high standards for establishing a charge against someone. Every charge must be established by two or three witnesses to make sure that an innocent person is never falsely convicted. According to God's law, if it is found out that someone brought forward a false accusation against someone, the false accuser is actually required to bear the penalty that would have been due the accused person had they been guilty. In God's sight, therefore, to bring a false accusation is a very serious charge. It is a violation of the ninth commandment. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. So someone who goes about spreading gossip or slandering others is guilty of bearing false witness. If we hear a juicy rumor about someone, our first reaction should not be to think about all the people we want to go and tell, but it should rather be skepticism, not receiving a charge unless it is established by two or three witnesses. And if we learn that what we heard really is true, our response should not be to pass it along as the latest gossip, but rather to pray for that person. And let us not turn our prayer requests into a rumor mill either. The sin of slander and gossip can be easily disguised and cloaked in good intentions when it is presented as a prayer request. The sins of others should not be conversation fodder among Christians. If you feel an excitement or a rush when you hear about something that so-and-so did, take that thought captive and repent. A godly, mature woman ought to take no pleasure in such things. If it was a brother or sister in the Lord who shared this with you, there is nothing wrong with asking. Should we really be talking about them like this? As Pastor Brian preached last Sunday, Titus was called to sharply rebuke the Cretan church because godly rebuke is part of how God shapes his church. Therefore, we ought to be willing to give and receive such rebukes as we grow in holiness. Older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. To become a slave to much wine is to allow it to take a hold on you. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Christians must not have addictions. We have one Lord, and we must not allow anything else to have lordship over us. If we are users of a substance that we cannot live without, we need to ask ourselves, are we being dominated by this thing? 
Do I have control over this, or does this thing, this substance, have control over me? The calling on all of us, in verse 18, I will not be dominated by anything. If we find that something is controlling us, our calling is to break free from the hold that it has on us. Psalm 104, verses 14 and 15 says, You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. Understood properly, food and drink and the things of the earth are gifts that point us to the goodness of the giver. As we take pleasure in the gifts that God has given us, we are reminded that they are only snippets of our good God at whose right hand there are pleasures forevermore. When we misuse the gifts that God has given us, we will ruin the pleasure and we will miss the intended purpose. Instead of being a signpost to God, it becomes an idol. Instead of bringing pleasure, it brings destruction. This is true of wine, food, sex, entertainment, all good things that the Lord has given uh, when used and understood properly. So older women are not to be slaves to much wine. Their consumption of alcohol must not have control over them. They are to demonstrate reverence and propriety. Someone with a drinking problem will not be a reverent and respectable person. So godly women, therefore, must not be slaves to much wine, but, continuing in our passage, they must teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. An older woman must teach what is good and train the young women. Here we have a very clear mission that has been given to the older women. Ladies, you have an important job to do. Your calling is to teach the young women what is good, very specifically is to teach them to love their husbands and children. There are some important implications here too, for if older women are going to teach the younger women, the older women are gonna to need to know the word. When a, godly woman, when a godly older woman opens her mouth, it ought to be biblical wisdom that flows forward. The fruit of a life spent walking with the Lord and soaking in his word. Young women do not have the experience that older women have. A godly woman who's been married for 20, 30, 40 or more years has had a lot of experience in loving their husbands and children, applying biblical principles to their marriage and mothering, so then who better to train the young women in these areas than the older women? Everyone has some wisdom to offer. Even if you feel like you've screwed up in your own marriage and parenting, you've now got some great insight on what not to do. Whether you feel your life is a success story or a list of failures, you have gained experience, and as a result, you have wisdom to give. And even older women who have never been married or had children, if you've been spending time in the Word, you can still offer insight and encouragement. Now there's a way of thinking in our culture that says, unless you have experienced something personally, you have no right to speak into that subject or even have an opinion about it. Uh, this way of thinking assumes that the only valid means of acquiring knowledge is experientially. Now this is actually at odds with the Christian worldview because the Christian view says, God has spoken in his word and whatever God says, we need to listen, and it really doesn't matter how experienced a person is. I'm reminded of a pastor's conference that I was at recently, uh, where one preacher was telling the story of how he began in ministry. Uh, he was made the preacher of his church at around age 19, something very young like that. Um, and at his installation service, his mentor said to the church, now you might be thinking, what is this boy going to teach me about my marriage? What is this boy going to teach me about raising my teenager? What is this boy going to teach me about old age? And then he yells, whatever this book tells him to tell you. The helpfulness and authority of instruction comes not from the experience of the messenger, but it comes from the word of God rightly handled. So even then, if you have not been married or had children yourself, 
You can saturate yourselves in the scriptures and be a blessing and an encouragement to others in what they are called to in marriage and child rearing. Back to our text. As we mentioned, older women have a special calling here to train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands. Now here is a passage that is about as unpolitically correct as they come. We need to be okay with that. Our calling as Christians is not political correctness. Our calling is godliness. I'm realizing more and more that in many cases, political correctness demands the exact opposite of what God requires in his word. Our calling is to be biblical. Our goal is to align our lives with what God has called us to in his word. So anytime we come up to something in the word of God that goes against our sensibilities, we have a decision to make. Will we obey God? Will we submit to his word? Is God truly our Lord? And if we find this happening to us frequently, when we really don't like the things we come across in God's word, we ought to ask ourselves, why is that? Why do we find it difficult to yield ourselves to scripture? Could it be that we've absorbed our values and our worldview from the culture? Is it possible that we have blind spots in our thinking Areas where we have adopted the world's values instead of God's. We need to remember that we are all sinners, fallen in Adam. Sin has affected every part of our being, our thoughts, our wills, our emotions, and our reasoning. They have all been in infected and affected by sin. Even after we have been born again, there is still the presence of indwelling sin that we need to continue to fight against, putting it to death daily. The calling on Christians in Romans 12, verse 2 is this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So because of the influence that sin has on our minds, we need to have our minds renewed. We need to seek to align our thinking with God's will. God alone is the standard of righteousness, and he has revealed for us in his word what is right. As we've covered in our last series on scripture from Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's word is perfect, sure, right, and pure. It is where we go to have our souls revived, to be made wise, to rejoice our hearts, and to have our eyes enlightened. And because of our fallen state, this is something that we desperately need. So if you find yourself disagreeing with God's word, I would encourage you to remind yourself of these truths. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So the first duty for the young women is to love their husbands and children. We covered earlier a little bit about love, but we'll expand a bit more. Biblical love is selfless love. Love that is willing to put others first, desiring their best. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Older women are called to train the young women how to live this way, loving their children and their husbands. Now, just a quick side note, so people don't get the idea that this is a one-sided arrangement, scripture also calls husbands to love their wives. In Ephesians 5, husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, taking the role of self-sacrificial leadership. 
So please don't get the idea that this is a one-sided relationship. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. The young women are called to be self-controlled. We've already covered what self-control is in our instructions for the older men, but we should mention that young women will likely face different temptations than older men. The young women must be in control of themselves, seeking to honor God with their actions, words, thoughts, emotions, and everything. When it comes to our sin, God never permits us to see ourselves as victims. No matter what our circumstances are, no matter how somebody else has hurt us, no matter what kind of pain or stress or hormones we may be experiencing, we never get to excuse our bad behavior. Because we are made in the image of God, we are held accountable as moral agents. We are not accountable for the way that others treat us, but in every circumstance, we are responsible for how we respond. To the younger women, in, every, in, in any and every circumstance, God calls you to exercise self-control. The young women are also called to be pure or chaste. Purity refers to being morally clean, free from any sort of defilement. Within marriage, this means being solely devoted to your husband. In all areas of life, a young woman is to seek purity. In her speech, in her actions, in the way she dresses, she is to be guided by a commitment to purity. Now, something else I should want to address before we move on. Many people tend to equate purity with virginity. And they might believe that if they lost their virginity before marriage, that they are now living impure within their marriage. This is not true. The sacrifice of Jesus has taken all of our impurity. No matter what your sin, no matter what your life was like before you came to Christ, Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient to wash you as white as snow. For a redeemed sinner, your sin does not define you, but your union with Christ does. All of us have sinned and fallen short and are found to be impure and defiled before our holy God. But all who repent of their sins and turn to Christ as Lord and Savior are united to him and are credited with his righteousness. In the eyes of God, we are as pure and clean as the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. This is really critical for us to understand. Many Christians go through their lives with feelings of guilt that they carry with them for years. This is not God's intention for his people. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 tells us that the purpose of grief or sorrow... Uh, it tells us what the purpose is of grief or sorrow or guilt for sin. Paul writes, Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So if you are living in unrepentant sin, that guilt you feel is intended by God to produce repentance within you. Confess your sin to God and anyone that you have wronged, and then trust that God has forgiven you. The people I'm talking to right now are the people who have repented of their sin, yet continue to feel guilt and shame over their sin. While there may be earthly consequences for our sin we have to live with, feeling guilt before God should not be one of them. If your guilt has produced repentance, then it no longer has a function. Which means that if you continue to experience guilt after you have repented, it is no longer godly guilt that you are feeling. What you need then is the gospel. Brothers and sisters, memorize verses to preach to yourself and to your feelings of guilt. Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 33 and 34, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn. Amen. Or 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. 
Behold, the new has come. Preach this to yourself daily. Preach this to the devil who tries to bring a charge against you. If you are in Christ, there is no charge of sin that sticks to you. Christ bore all your condemnation. There is none left for you. Live in the freedom of your justification before God. So whatever sin you may have in your past, if you are a Christian, if you have been united to Christ by faith, you are pure in the eyes of God and you can live a life that is pure in the eyes of God. For the married woman, a pure life is being committed solely to your husband. It is seeking purity in your speech, in your dress, and in your conduct. Through the grace of Christ and the power of the Spirit, you can fulfill the calling to live a pure life. Now, this does not require us to downplay in any way the severity of sin, but rather to emphasize, proclaim, and believe the total sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. If you are in Christ, then in the eyes of God, you are pure. Young women are to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands. So young women are to be working at home, or they are to be keepers of the home. This describes the woman's primary role as the manager of the household. Whatever else a woman is involved in, she must not neglect her primary calling as keeper of the home, loving her husband and children through devoting herself to caring for them. We see further evidence of the primary calling on women in 1 Timothy 5. Paul here describes the requirements for widows to be enrolled as widows that would be cared for by the church. So among the requirements is that they have been faithful to their husbands, having brought up children, and having shown hospitality. Paul's instructions to younger widows is not that they would then commit their lives to singleness, but in verse 14 he instructs that they get married, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. So the aim in giving requirements for widows was to ensure that only godly women would be receiving aid from the church. This is not meant to be something that unbelieving, opportunistic women would take advantage of in order to get a free ride. So I think it is fair to say that the list of requirements for widows will also be an excellent representation of what a godly woman looks like. And it is very telling that both in the requirements for older widows, the instruction for younger widows, and the instructions to younger women in general that we saw in Titus, women are called to bear children, manage their households, and to be faithful to their husbands. The picture we have of a godly woman in scripture is one who devotes herself to her family, is faithful and submissive to her husband, is devoted to bearing and raising godly children, working at home, making the home a place of hospitality, where fellow believers are served, the afflicted are cared for, and good works are done. This is kingdom work. When God created mankind, he commanded us, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God's design was to fill the earth with his image bearers who would then take dominion, filling the earth with the image of God, bringing order out of chaos and ascribing glory to God so that all creation would resound to the praise of his glory. Children are described by God as a blessing and a heritage, the fruit of the womb a reward. Psalm 127 verse 4 says, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Now, in order for children to be effective arrows, I believe they need to be sharpened. They must be prepared and equipped. The primary place where this happens is the home. The primary equippers of the children are the parents. Every single passage in scripture that specifically addresses the discipleship of youth is directed at their parents. Now, this doesn't mean that the church doesn't have an important role but it does show us the primary place of the home in discipleship. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 6, where we get a description of what a godly home looks like. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. 
And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The picture that we get here is of a disciple who loves God with heart, mind, and soul, who saturates themselves and their household in the law of God. The law is written on the doorposts, it is written on their hands, and whatever frontlets are, it is between their eyes. And then notice the instruction regarding children. You shall teach these things diligently to your children, speaking scripture when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down and when you rise. In other words, in every area of life, whatever you happen to be doing, you are taking opportunities to disciple your children, teaching them about God as you drive, as you wake them up, when you get them ready in the morning, when you're eating supper together. Home life ought to be saturated in scripture, every activity in life being an opportunity for discipleship. Although this portion of our text in Titus is addressing the woman's role in the home, as we talk about discipleship, we need to mention that the man is not absent from this. Fathers get a direct command in Ephesians 6 verse 4 where it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As we mentioned earlier, husbands are called to imitate Christ in marriage, loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In their role as head, men need to take leadership, discipling their families, saturating them in scripture, leading them in prayer and in worship to God. So to get practical here, fathers, lead your families in worship daily. It doesn't have to be complicated. Read a passage of scripture to your family, pray together and sing praises to our creator. Make this a daily habit. In our home, we do it after supper whenever we're home together. And it's a simple way to fulfill part of your role to your family. Bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Show them you value scripture, praying and singing praises to God by leading them in it daily. Another calling on men is to provide for their families so that all of this discipleship and kingdom work can continue. In 1 Timothy 5, in the passage about widows which we referenced earlier, men are instructed to provide for their relatives. 1 Timothy 5.8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A man who does not provide for his household is a man who has denied the faith. In order for the home to function as God requires, somebody needs to bring home the bacon. God commands the man to do this work, and God has equipped him for it. Somebody also needs to work at home to manage the household and keep things operating there. God commands the woman to do this work, and he has gifted and equipped her for it. Together they build a home where kingdom work is done, and every task, no matter how menial it may seem, is an absolutely necessary part of kingdom building. Every day of working in the office, every ditch that is trenched, every dish that is washed, Every diaper that is changed is aiming at the glory of God and is a vital part of seeking to raise godly offspring who will be equipped, trained, and discipled to be arrows in the hands of a warrior. The home is a crucial battleground in our fight with the enemy. It is a training ground for the next generation of disciples. If we are faithful in this, there is no telling what God might do with our faithfulness. But what a tragedy it would be to let those opportunities go to waste. When we stand before God to give an account of how we stewarded that which he entrusted to us, will we be able to report that we were faithful in discipling our families? Did we seek to point them to Christ through everything we did? Did we take advantage of the time we had with them driving in the car, eating supper together? Did we train them to know the scriptures? Did we saturate them in God's word, teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded? Or will we have to hang our heads in shame before God, admitting that we had more conversations about Spider-Man than Jesus Christ? Admitting that more of our energy was spent worrying about what kind of college our children would get into 
than whether or not their faith would survive that college? What will we hear from the Lord on the day we have to give an account? Will it be, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or will it be a rebuke because we spent our lives pursuing earthly things and neglected the duties assigned to us by God? The home is a critical point for our kingdom building efforts. The calling on a woman is to be working at home, sorry, the calling on a woman to be working at home is an immensely high calling, and it is critical that it not be neglected, looked down upon, or held in low esteem. Our culture right now shames motherhood. Our feministic culture is at war with marriage and child rearing. Women are made to feel as though their worth and value is linked to having a career outside of the home, and if they do not, then they are somehow lesser than those who do. My theory for why this has come under attack is that the enemy knows how significant a battleground this is. Considering the significance that scripture places on the home, we should expect that this would be an institution that the enemy would be keen to attack. If marriage, fruitfulness, and discipleship are key components to God's plan for building the kingdom, then we should expect to see exactly what we are seeing from the enemy. Pornography, homosexuality, fornication, adultery, abortion, transgenderism, the prioritizing of career over family, feminism, and egalitarianism, these are all attacks on God's design for men and women, and they all result in the exact same thing, fruitlessness and death. So how do we fight these things? Faithfulness to God. Get married. Love your spouse. If God will grant it, have children and raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Continuing in our text. And so train the young, younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Young women are called to be kind. Kindness must permeate all that she does. Without kindness, she will not be able to fulfill her other duties. A woman who is unkind is not someone who can love her husband and children well. A woman who is unkind will not be able to show Christ's love in hospitality. Kindness is crucial. Her demeanor ought to be warm. Her home ought to be inviting. A godly woman is a kind woman. Young women also ought to be submissive to their own husbands. As we mentioned earlier, marriage is meant to be a representation of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church, where a husband is called to imitate Christ's love for his bride in giving himself up for her. So here now we come to the woman's role. She is called to submit to her husband as the church submits to Christ. Submission is a recognition of authority. Biblical submission is a willing and glad obedience to God-given authority. A woman who submits to her husband is one who is willing to defer to his leadership, committed to gladly following where he leads. A biblically functioning marriage is a picture of the gospel. We represent Christ and the church to the world through the submission of wives and the self-sacrificial love of husbands. Now, an important clarification here, submission is not about becoming a doormat or about not having a personality. We need to remember that what Adam needed was a helper, not a doormat. Doormats are good for wiping your shoes on and not much else. A doormat is not a life partner. As we've been describing biblical womanhood, I hope that what you're seeing is a kind, vibrant, life-filled woman who loves God, loves her husband and her children. Being a submissive wife is entirely compatible with having a personality. Those two are not mutually exclusive. Submission is also not a blind, limitless obedience. What I mean by this is that no woman should ever follow her husband into sin. Nobody has the authority or the right to command what God forbids or to forbid what God commands. Not a husband, not a government, not a pastor. God has ultimate authority, and all true authority is mediated authority. A wife submits to her husband because she is in submission to Christ. 
just as we ought to submit to governing authorities and to the elders in our church because of our submission to the Lord. So here I just want to pause and point out how different the biblical picture of womanhood is from the culture's perspective. If we ask somebody on the street, how are you raising your daughters? What, what do you want them to become? You may hear something like, I'm raising them to be fierce, independent, and strong. Somebody who doesn't take no for an answer. You can imagine the kind of looks you'd get if you said that you were raising your daughters to be reverent, self-controlled, pure, kind, submissive, workers at home. <laughs> Challenge for us here. Have we embraced God's ideals for our daughters, or have we absorbed the culture's ideals? Continuing in our passage. Notice also that the young women are called to submit to their own husbands. All women are not called to submit to all men. Women are called to submit to their own husbands. Other men do not have authority over my wife. In fact, in order for her to be in submission to me, she cannot be in submission to other men. This also has very practical implications for us as the church, the bride of Christ. Uh, as Christ's bride, we cannot be in submission to any other masters. The church is called to submit to Christ, not his competitors. There are many other authorities out there that are seeking our allegiance, many competing worldviews, ideas, philosophies, and systems. We've already talked about how we may have been influenced by our culture, how we may hold blind spots in our thinking, and we need to recognize that any ideas or views that we hold that are contrary to the word of God are places where we have been submitting to rival lords. As Christ's church, we must submit to our own husband, Christ himself, which means that we must seek to obey the word of our Lord in scripture. We must seek to think biblically, rooting out all of our blind spots and seeking to bring all of our thinking into submission to the Lordship of Christ. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. We began this section with the instruction for Titus to teach what accords with sound doctrine, and we saw how there is a type of living that flows from believing the gospel. The fact is, if professing Christians live in a way that is contrary to what Christ has commanded of his church, this reflects negatively on the gospel. If we claim to be followers of Christ and we disregard his word, we do damage to our witness. We can, by our, by our rejection of biblical authority, cause the word of God to be reviled. While this principle applies to other circumstances, Paul is particularly applying this to women who are unsubmissive and refuse to attend their duties in the home. So to the older women, God commands you, talk about these things. Encourage the younger women to love their husbands and children, to exercise self-control, to work at home, to be kind, and to be submissive to their husbands. I know this is not a popular message, but it's vital, and God gives this assignment to the older women to train the younger women in these things. So be bold, knowing that even if the younger women you talk to don't like what you have to say, so long as you are presenting them with biblical truth, it is not you they have a problem with, it's God. So to wrap up, here's the challenge for all of us. Are we seeking to live in a way that accords with sound doctrine? Does the gospel produce fruit in us? Do our lives indicate that God has transformed our hearts? Do we desire the things of God? Do we view things the way that God does? Are we being transformed by the renewing of our minds, seeking to align our thinking with God's will? True believers who believe the gospel, who have turned to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, have the Holy Spirit. We need to always remember that any time we as Christians are hearing instructions, we are never being called to obey these instructions in our own strength. We are not called to simply pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and try to earn our way into heaven. In verse 1, Titus was instructed to teach what accords with sound doctrine. That is, to teach people to live in a way that accords with the truth of the gospel. This is a really important point. Whenever Christians are hearing imperatives or instructions, 
We are to obey these commands from a place of victory. These commands are coming to us in light of what Christ has already accomplished. So we begin the fight for holiness with the knowledge that Jesus has fulfilled the commands of God's law on our behalf. We start with victory. We start with full and total forgiveness, knowing that Christ has taken the full weight of our condemnation. We start with the knowledge that God indwells us with the Holy Spirit. We begin with the full pardon and the knowledge that our performance is not the basis of our right standing before God. We begin the fight resting in Christ, asking for help from the Holy Spirit, knowing that it is only by his power that we can live a life that is pleasing to God. When we fall, we are not back to square one, but we confess our sin to God and to anyone whom we have sinned against, asking for forgiveness, fully assured that God forgives us in Christ. We then seek to live in light of what Christ has already accomplished. We seek to live a life that displays the love of God to the world. We seek to live a life that accords with the gospel. Amen.